I swim three days a week for an hour, and I bike four days a week for an hour or two, mostly two, and then I run four days a week for an hour, sometimes two. In July of 2005, I was out biking. We were on Goshen Road in Chester County, and I was coming up over an overpass, and a truck was coming up behind me, pulling a trailer, and the truck went wide to pass me, and as soon as he did, there was a car coming up the other side, so the truck pulled over, and his trailer fishtailed as it came and hit, hit my bike and, and me on it. It was pushed off the road and ran right into a telephone pole and unclipped out of my bike pedals and hit a fence. So I tumbled into a fence and because of that impact, it knocked me back onto the road. So it was like a ping pong as I was being tossed around. I'd crushed all my facial, all the facial bones. So they knew immediately that it was a head injury. So they were prepared when I arrived. They were prepared before I arrived. She was about as sick as you can get with this uh, injury. Initially, when she came to us, she was not awake, she wasn't moving, she wasn't opening her eyes. It was a, a very uh, uh, tricky circumstance at the time. She, uh, she had uh, significant brain swelling, she had uh, substantial uh, brain injury, and uh, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, touch and go for a while. So this is the CAT scan, uh, Candace, from your um, from the day of your accident, about an hour and a half after your accident. Then it was done in the emergency room as one of the evalu initial evaluations. So if we go up a little bit higher, what you can see is there's these white areas here which are contusions. With those kinds of in in injuries, um, in somebody her age, there's usually about a 30% mortality. If you think of the brain floating in fluid, right. which, uh, it, the, the skull stops and the brain keeps going. So it's called a contra-coup injury. It was a watchful waiting that it would be assessed later on in, throughout the night and I was admitted to ICU and uh, about 10 o'clock at night then my brain started to swell and an emergency craniotomy was necessary. Basically taking off half of the skull on one side um, and then opening the dura which is the covering over the brain uh, so that the brain can swell instead of pushing inwards it swells outwards and takes the pressure off the brain stem. Initially, I was, uh, I would say I was sort of traumatized, you know, for, uh, I'd say for the first three or four days after her accident, I was uh, uh, candidly in a, in a little bit of a fog. There's a high probability she'd survive, and she would have language function and move her arms and legs, but I just didn't know what her cognitive function would be like, and that would be a, that would take months and months to sort that out. There is so much about healing that we don't understand yet, about healing the brain. We used to tell her, you can do this, Candace, you can do this. We would open her eyes and we would show her the picture of the girls and have her track, uh, track that picture, or to even see if she was in there, if she could track it. And we would tell her, Mom, it's time to wake up, it's time to wake up and uh, in that way, try to, to uh, make some kind of contact with her, uh, even on a subconscious level. I was four when my mom had an accident, and I remember her going for a long time and wondering when she was gonna come back. I just thought it was like a dream or something. I didn't really realize it until after the fact and after when she was recovering. I thought she'd be better within a week. I didn't understand that it would be month or months or years before she was well enough to do some of the things that my mom would normally do. You're so driven as a mom to take care of your children that that's, that is a turning point that you have to get better.
Mm -hmm. You did that a nice looks, job. Uh, that, looks, that looks pretty, uh, uh -huh. pretty good, girls. I think that it wasn't my time, that, um, that it was an opportunity for me. It was, it was a gift to me, having all of these events align themselves so that I could recover. I believe one of the main things was that, first of all, she was in very good physical condition before the accident from being an athlete, biking, running, swimming all the time, so I'm sure that helped. But also I think, first of all, her faith. She has always been had a very strong faith, and I think that really kept her going throughout all the difficult times. We just don't know why she would recover so much better than perhaps somebody else would, with a very similar appearing injury on both imaging and neurological diagnosis. That's still something that's on my mind all the time, and, and she knows that, but that's what she loves to do, and, and uh, uh, that's, that's her vice, and uh, I try to accommodate that as much as possible. I was coaxing him into agreeing and supporting me doing the, this next Ironman, and so I said it to him that, that athletes have longer longevity, happy life, and, uh, he, and he wrote back, he said, yes, it'll lengthen your life and shorten mine. She's not typical. Um, she'd be more on the unusual side, uh, unusual in the degree of recovery she's experienced. What is it about that physiology of a very fit person that can make a better environment for recovery from traumatic brain injury? With this device, we're able to deliver low strain, such as a mild concussion, or high strain, such as a, a severe injury, and then take a look at what happens to the cytoskeleton. And right now we're really interested in what happens to the microtubules that make up the backbone of the axon. The brain is probably the least resilient organ we have, and that's because neurons don't duplicate normally. If a neuron dies, or if these nerve fibers disconnect, they're gone forever. So that's a psychosocial component, but we wonder whether or not there's also a cellular component Maybe there's some kind of an optimal um, health of a cell uh, in, a, in an organism or a person who is a great athlete that actually contributes to their better prognosis after severe traumatic brain injury. There is no treatment, current treatment, for traumatic brain injury. And when I say treatment, I mean a drug that I think should be given to anybody, even with concussion, which is called mild traumatic brain injury, all the way to severe. We need to do more. And so she's there, she's, you know, She's got a smile on her face, she's a very positive person, she really wants to help. Because she's so involved, she can actually, from a patient's perspective, direct the future of research, and that's quite a thing to be able to do. Any small thing that we can do to advance the, uh, the practice of uh, brain injury repair and, and understanding a little bit more about traumatic brain injury and recovery from traumatic brain injury, we'd love to support, and that's, that's what we're trying to do now. It's really a debt that we cannot repay. They saved my mother's life. It's, it's one of the things about this job that is so enormously rewarding um, to be able to give somebody back their life again. I mean, that, there are not too many jobs like that. So I, I consider myself extremely lucky to be in the position I'm in. So any gratitude she has, I have 10 times more uh, to be able to do what I can do. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, what a blessing you are to me. Yeah. I love seeing her. I love seeing her. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. I feel lucky that she's still alive. Thank you so much because she was in a bed, but now she's doing so much, and it was all because of you. I'm honored to be, to be part of someone's hope. <laughs>